Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Tracking Antibiotic Resistance Across Space and Time, presented by Sean Conlin, Associate Investigator, Microbial Genomics Section, National Institutes of Health. I'm Alexis Krause of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Conlin. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Hi, so as Alexis pointed out, today I'm going to be talking to you about tracking antibiotic resistance across space and time. Um, our lab uh, does a lot of genomics. We do a lot of uh, genome sequencing, um, microbiome sequencing, and things like that, metagenomics. Today, I'm pretty much going to be talking about uh, using genome sequencing in a sort of uh, forensic sort of way to, to track down relationships between bacteria, um, both across space and time. Uh, to give you a little bit of a signpost as to where we're going to be going today, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on uh, what we're really interested in in this talk, which is carbapenem resistance. Um, and a, a lot of our work um, stems from um, work at the NIH Clinical Center, um, first starting with a, a cluster of Klebsiella pneumonia uh, infections from 2011, um, going through a follow-up on two patients from that uh, cluster, and then we're going to talk uh, about, uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about um, a study we did on organisms that are in the hospital plumbing system and some of the environmental uh, areas of the hospital. And these are all going to be tied together um, in terms of either tracking things as they change across time, looking at things like plasma dynamics and, and uh, isolates, or uh, as they relate to space or um, uh, surfaces and patients. Things like that. So uh, the, the gene that we're really interested in um, for most of our studies is the carapenemase uh, gene. There's a couple of different variants of it you may have heard of. Uh, the Klebsiella pneumonia carapenemase KPC is the one that we're interested in, uh, but others that you may have heard of include things like NDM, which is the uh, New Delhi metallo-metallactamase, or OXA48. Um, and as you can see from this slightly dated um, uh, Amer uh, map of the United States from the CDC, it's pretty much found all over the United States. And, um, and so that's one of the reasons that we're really interested in it, because it is, it is pretty widespread. And, and if you looked at a, a world map, you would see that these genes have slightly differing um, propensities across different parts of the world. Um, so the metallo or the, uh, the beta lactamase um, cleaves this uh, lactam ring that you'll see in the upper uh, left hand corner of kind of a stereotypical kind of beta lactam antibiotic. Um, classic uh, carapenemase um, drugs are things like imipenem and miropenem, which are in the lower corner. Um, and one of the features of the KPC gene is that it is on plasmids typically. Uh, it can also occur in the chromosome, but it's it very often in a plasmid inside the context of a transposable element. And so um, mobility is a real issue for this, uh, for this gene. So uh, a lot of times what we're interested in, and if you think about classic um, studies of how bacteria are transmitted from person to person, you sort of think about the scenario that you see in front of you which is, uh, you know, person A and person transmits something to person B, and it might be some bacteria, and, and that, um, that little circle inside is a plasmid. And, and, and so this would be a fairly straightforward thing to track down. You might be in, in, a, in a lab culturing um, bacteria and finding out if, if two people had the same uh, bacteria with the same antibiotic susceptibilities. But there's also this scenario where either within a patient or within some other uh, niche or environment, the plasmid that you're interested in with the KPC gene has actually been transmitted in some way to another host. 
and then that host is then transmitted to a different person. And so now it's it's sort of like I like to liken to the sort of cup and ball game that you see sometimes magicians do where they they have a cup and they're moving a ball around underneath things. Now the, the ball that you're trying to follow, the, the plasmid, has moved to a different host. Um, and the same thing can happen on, on surfaces, as I mentioned. Something can be transmitted to a, a surface or a reservoir in the environment where you can have these same sorts of interactions going on. And epidemiologists are interested in separating all of this out from the, this last case, which is, is transmissions within the hospital compared to somebody walking in off the street with an organism. Um, so nosocomial transmissions are very worrisome for hospitals. You're trying to prevent that, um, and, and that's how you prevent outbreaks. One of the ways in which you prevent outbreaks within a hospital or clusters of infections within a hospital is preventing these sort of nosocomial or within hospital transmissions. Uh, so uh, we've, we've done quite a lot of work in the lab on um, this, uh, this cluster of carapenem-resistant uh, organisms from 2011. Um, and this was beautiful work done by um, Evan Snitkin, who is, is in the, was in the lab at the time. And he, uh, he basically elucidated this um, transmission network where a single index patient through three separate transmissions started this, this cascade of, um, of transmission events. And in total, uh, there were uh, 19 patients with 18 transmissions, so the index plus, plus a transmission to each patient. And so, and in this work that he did, uh, he used both epidemiological data, which is, is indicated by the inferences that are in these red arrows, and genomic uh, single nucleotide variant data, which is in the black arrows. And you couldn't have created this transmission map with either piece of data alone. And what we determined is that it's a clonal transmission of sequence type 258 club tail and pneumonia. Um, and we figured out just from, um, this is all done with 454 sequencing at the time, um, with uh, scaffolding to known references, we were able to figure out that there are three plasmids, uh, PKPQIL, which is a known KPC-carrying plasmid, um, PAC-154, which is a small sort of accessory plasmid, and, and PKPN-498, which is a very large, rather large plasmid. Um, we followed up this study because this was a fairly important outbreak for our clinical center. We followed this up with a, a oh, sorry, and so this is the, this is the actual, um, the three plasmids kind of shown uh, all together with the, um, with the organism. And so uh, we followed this up, and I'm not going to talk about this too much, but I kind of wanted to give you a flavor for some of the things that we do uh, with a, a paper in 2014 where we looked at all of the other KPC positive organisms that cropped up following that outbreak. We were trying to make sure that there weren't any additional transmissions of these plasmids. Um, and this is all done with uh, long read sequencing, actually on the, the PacBio um, instrument. And so we were able to elucidate lots and lots of different plasmids. Um, each of these organisms has at least one um, KPC positive plasmid, sometimes multiple, sometimes multiple copies of KPC um, on a single plasmid. And so you can see sort of the diversity of plasmids and things like that that you can get out of, of these organisms. Um, and we, we really learned a lot from this and, and found a couple of classes of plasmids, including a, a plasmid that we refer to kind of in shorthand uh, as the ink N plasmid, because it is an incompatibility N type plasmid that's widespread. And, and we found it in subsequent studies. And I think you'll see that a little bit later. So um, moving on to sort of the first part of my talk, uh, now that we're through with the background, um, is this long-term colonization of patients from the, the 2011 study. So we followed up on um, on two of the patients um, who remain colonized long-term with KPC-positive organisms. And so in a, in a time span over, over the course of years, um, we re received samples. Um, and these are, these are samples of involving patient care. So these weren't patients who were necessarily, um, we weren't sampling these for scientific reasons. They were taken as part of their routine care, as part of culturing. And so we sort of get what we get um, as far as timing and, and what organisms we were able to, to, to ascertain. Um, and this is a, a timeline of, of those two patients, patients 15 and 16. And it's a relatively busy slide, I realize, but um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of sort of frequency of samplings and things like that, with all of those red diamonds being cultures that were, were negative for KPC-positive organisms. And the, the, the filled pluses or the... Um, uh, the filled circles, the the, the filled uh, symbols are actually uh, isolates we sequenced, and uh, the rest are positives. And so I'm going to be talking about the isolates that we sequenced from these um, two different patients, 
and they, they tell two different stories about what happens when you start with, um, remember, we're starting with a, a clonal outbreak. So we know what the, the original organism was and what happens to it over time. So, so this is patient 15. And as I said, at day one, sort of at the, the, the first culture that we have for a KPC positive organism, you're going to see an organism that looks very much like uh, what I showed you for the outbreak. So it's three plasmids, um, the important one being the PKPQIL plasmid. Um, and we also have some markers that are on these genes, two that are on the PAC154 and uh, three that are on the PKPN498 plasmid. And so what you're going to see is over time, um, as we now switch to the second isolate, there's not very much has changed. Those markers are all still there by PCR. And then by sequencing, um, we still see the same configuration of plasmids. And this is 437 days later. But you see something different on day 642. This is the third isolate we sequence. Um, and if you're, if you're keen, if you're, if you're sort, of, sort of looking carefully at that diagram, you'll see that the plasmids have changed a little bit. I'll cycle back and forth real quick. Um, and you'll see in a minute why that is. Um, and you'll see that some of the bands in the PCRs have, have changed. And so we, we've, We've done a lot of sequencing on these organisms, and the sequencing um, told us a lot, but uh, I just wanted to point out that we always try to also verify these sorts of things with PCR. So that's why you sort of see the side-by-side -side PCR um, assays to kind of verify that we really are seeing the changes and, and uh, recombinations and whatnot um, that we see by sequencing. Because we're always a little concerned about you know, the possibility of things like sequencing or assembly errors so what's happening in the case of these two plasmids is, is shown here. So in, in the, the kind of banded lots of colors uh, left half of your screen, there's two plasmids. You'll see PAC154 labeled up at the top, and you'll see PKPN498 uh, kind of around the, the, the left-hand side. Um, and this is a circos plot showing uh, the bands are showing you um, recombination events that we're able to detect by sequencing. Um, the most interesting one being this PKPN821. That is the kind of recombinant plasmid that you saw in two colors in the previous slide. And what you'll see is that this very small plasmid um, has had a, a, a recombination event where it's picked up uh, a bunch of genes the, um, that are shown by the um, kind of orange colored band for um, antibiotic resistance. Those have been inserted into the middle of and disrupted a colicin gene in, or a toxin gene in the middle of that uh, AAC154 plasmid. And there's been a small duplication. Um, in addition, the a remaining piece of that large PKPN498 plasmid that's shown by the purple band has excised out and, and formed its own new smaller plasmid called PKPN FFF. Um, you'll notice uh, if you look carefully at those colors that uh, those, um, the points where those um, circos bands are connecting the two plasmids, there's some little brown slashes. Those are, um, those are transposable elements. So the, all the transposable elements and resolvases and whatnot are colored brown. So this is probably, these, these breaks are probably occurring on or around or being mediated by transposable elements. So we thought this was pretty interesting that, uh, that this, these two plasmids have recombined. Um, chunks of that larger plasmid have now been lost, um, including the, the the iron um, acquisition sort of region, which is, is marked by that FECD gene. And that's actually one, if I were to go back to the previous slide, that's the, one of the markers that we were looking at. So this is the, the PKPQL plasmid, which is the important plasmid those were tracking, didn't really change for this particular isolate. But, um, but these recombination events show you sort of how dynamic plasmids can be. So for patient 16, we had a, a pretty different um, situation. Um, and what we have here is, again, starting on, on all the way to your uh, left is the sort of original um, isolate. And what I've kind of got here is um, uh, diagrams of the plasmids that are contained by each organism that we've isolated. And so there's, a, there's two blue isolates, which are ST258, um, Klebsiella and ammonias. And then we later isolated um, two different ST37 Klebsiella and ammonias. And then we isolated at the very end the ST258 again. And we'll talk about that in a minute and what that means. And then there was also in there um, an E. coli that was, um, that was isolated containing this plasma. So there's some interesting features here. Again, if you're paying attention, um, you may remember that I told you that all of the, um, all of the outbreak isolates have three plasmids. But the, the organism that's all the way to the left actually is showing you five. 
Um, that's because this ISO, when we went back and looked in the 454 data, we found that there really were two very small cryptic plasmids. They're the two that are sort of at the bottom that are really only found in this ISO. Um, and we don't know where they came from, but they are, they are additional to that, um, to that organism. Um, but you'll notice if you look over to the, the second kind of cyan-colored um, club cell in ammonia ST37, one of those little extra plasmids actually pops up again. Um, it's, we don't, we don't have, um, one of the things I always point out about this slide is that there's probably a very complicated network of plasmid transmission and recombination events going on here. And we only see a few nodes out of this in this diagram because of what we've sequenced, what we had available in the sequence. Um, and so you can kind of, as you look over this, see how some plasmids have persisted over time. Um, you can see one interesting point is that that blue plasmid at the top uh, starts out at the far left as sort of the full-length plasmid, that is PKPN-498. Uh, there's a deletion insertion event the next time that we see that, that plasmid. And then the final time we see that organism, which is all the way to the right, the blue organism, it's gone. And I'm going to talk about that in a, in a bit in a minute um, because it's, it's a, a recurring theme. Uh, right now, what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is this plasmid, the red one. So it starts out as being a normal, the PKPQIL plasmid that we've isolated from these organisms. Um, and we see it in several places, and it's or at least two places at the very beginning where it looks essentially normal, or like, it, like the PKPQIL. Um, but then um, for the last four isolates, um, when we see it, it's, uh, there are recombinant regions, which are, are marked by yellow and green. And I'll show you a diagram a little bit of, of, of how that, that works out in a multiple alignment. Um, but these, these differences, are, these changes are, um, are something that we're not necessarily, uh, we're, they're going to be looking for in this case because uh, this is diversification of the plasma and it may be changing things like host range or some of the abilities on the plasma. So the reason we got interested in it is now if you look at this alignment, um, the, first, uh, the first plasmid at the top of this stacked alignment is the is the normal um, sort of PKPQIL plasmid. Um, it has a it has that dash sixty six designation because it has a, a couple of SNPs relative to the reference, and we just wanted to call it something slightly different. Um, and what you'll see is that as you as you move down this alignment, um, the the second plasmid is the one that was isolated from the E. coli, and you'll see that that yellow region is different. And then the third one is the one that was isolated from um, one of those ST37. And, and I apologize, I, I probably earlier, if you're not familiar with that terminology, ST stands for sequence type. And so that's just uh, that's a way to designate different strains of, of these organisms uh, by some, some housekeeping. Alert. So there's seven genes um, in the, the sequence typing uh, scheme for Klebsiella and pneumonia. So ST258 and ST37 just tell you that these are different strains of Klebsiella and pneumonia. Um, so anyways, uh, if you look at that yellow region, um, the right end of it is, um, is embedded in, uh, in a, uh, some red genes, and that actually is a um, restriction modification system. Um, and it's, it's interesting because um, and that, in that restriction modification system is interrupted such that the specificity subunit is different between PKPQIL-66 and the, the one that was isolated from the E. coli. Um, they're only about, um, I think, about 40% identical, 30 to 40% identical at the amino acid level. So we might predict that um, this restriction modification system between the, the first and second plasmids would have a different specificity. Um, and that might be something that you would need in order to expand your host range to a different organism. And in fact, um, other labs, um, uh, Dr. Barry Kreisler's lab, for instance, have isolated PKPQIL variants from E. coli before, and at least in some cases, uh, this region, this entire region, is, is deleted. Um, so this is the sort of thing we don't necessarily want to see um, for an important plasma like this that it could be expanding its host range. Um, and so that was that was something that was worth noting. Um, the other thing is that um, if you look all the way uh, down at the bottom. Uh, these recombinant regions actually match up with a totally a different plasmid that, um, that you can find in the reference database, this P PMK1-C uh, plasmid, um, which, which indicates, so we, we don't really know how these recombination events occurred, if they occurred sequentially with the yellow one happening first and then the green one, or if it was just a, a recombination from an, un an unknown donor like this PMK uh, uh, plasmid. So um, 
like I said, this is this is a, a different case from what we saw with patient 15s, where the, the the plasmids that were recombining were essentially these kind of accessory plasmids. This is actual modification to a plasmid that we really care about um, because it is carrying the, the KPC gene. So I had mentioned um, in this slide that the the blue plasmid um, appears to be uh, undergoing some sort of gene loss or, or sequence loss, and eventually it disappears completely um, in patient 16's isolates. Um, actually, when we looked at this carefully, um, we actually see that this happens um, in three different patients that are all at this sort of terminal end of this transmission diagram. I um, mean, you can see the three examples there um, with the, the intact plasmid at the top. Uh, the, the second plasmid is an example where it's basically lost that um, iron acquisition cluster and not much else. And then in patients uh, 15 and 16, it's lost that whole region plus a, uh, a chunk of the, the TRA genes, essentially the genes that are associated with plasmid transmission. So we haven't really looked into, into carefully into what exactly is going on here. And what we speculate is happening is that this plasmid may be important for, for living in other, other sort of niches, non-human niches, so either living in the environment or competing with organisms that are in other environments. And then once it's in a human host, perhaps, um, and this, this really is speculation, it's, it's not as necessary. And so, you know, as um, recombination events reduce the size of this plasma or eliminate it completely, there's not really a fitness cost to that. Um, and so this is another example of a, um, of, of a plasma that's, that's doing something interesting. And it's, it's happened three independent times. So we know that patients 18, 15, and 16 all started out with a complete copy of this plasma. So the last thing I want to talk about for this part of the story, um, before I get to my, my sort of first set of conclusions, is this sort of strain succession issue that we have. Um, so this is, this is patient 16, and we know that they started out with an ST258 sequence type of um, club seal and ammonia. But then through the, the isolates we sequenced and then through PCR, because uh, these two sequence types have different capsular loci, and so we have primers that we can sync into those capsules and basically do a screen just to see uh, which one it is. It's not perfect, but it gives us some idea of, um, of what organism is there, if it's the ST258 or the ST37. And what we see is the pattern that you sort of see here uh, with days across the bottom. And uh, I kind of have it blurred out between the transitions because we don't, we don't have a good idea of exactly when it would have transitioned. Um, and one question that I do get a lot is, is about whether or not, um, so at, at some given time point, whether um, it's all ST258 or all ST37. And I can tell you that um, in this case, uh, we did do a couple of sort of almost anecdotal, they were small, very small scale experiments just due to the way that the samples were taken, where we plated and, and looked at multiple colonies uh, on two different samples and, and ran PCRs. And at least at the time, they were all the same organism. So, you know, it was all, you know, each, we, we did PCR on 20 organisms. All 20 organisms were ST258. Um, we don't know at every time point whether this is the case, but it was, it was a, a useful sort of small scale experiment. So some conclusions from this first part are uh, that patients can be longitudinally colonized by um, carbapenemase producing organisms on very sort of long time scales of years. This has been known before. Um, this is, isn't a novel finding, but um, it was something interesting for us uh, to sort of follow up over time. Um, more important to, to, to our interest is that during this time, um, plasmids can move around and plasmids can recombine. Um, this is not a static process where the organism is, is just sort of replicating and not doing much of anything there. There really are sort of large-scale things that could be going on with the plasmids um, within this organism, in including transmission to completely different organisms. And then um, the sort of last point that I made is that what, what may appear to be a, a sort of static um, colonization with a single organism, I mean, the club seal and pneumonia um, organisms, if you were to plate them out on uh, carbapenemase media, um, without doing sort of deeper molecular tests, they kind of, they all look the same. It is possible that they could have different morphologies, but it's also possible that you have a mixture of organisms um, with the same morphology, and you wouldn't necessarily pick that up with sort of routine clinical um, tests. So I'm going to switch gears a bit here and um, tell a different story about, uh, about hospital plumbing. Um, and... This is, uh, this is a study that, um, that we did with uh, the clinical center again. 
And uh, the first thing I want to kind of point out here is that what we did is, is the clinical center went through and collected samples from a variety of environmental sources, including wastewater um, going out to the manholes outside the hospital and the externals of the hospital and taking samples, um, sludge within pipes. Um, it eventually kind of went to housekeeping closets, housekeeping equipment, sink drains, things like that. Um, Somewhat uh, similar to with the patients, these were these were not um, necessarily exhaustively or systematically taken where, you know, they were spaced out over a certain period of time and, and, and exact locations. They were many times taken um, in response to um, concerns about a particular organism. So um, we didn't always get to pick or choose exactly what, you know, what organisms or what, what sort of time scale we got to collect these on. Um, I can say that you can sort of, if you look at the total number of samples and the number of samples with organisms that are carapenemase uh, carriers, you can see that the vast majority of them um, were negative. So that was actually a really good sign. Um, that was something that we thought was positive about this, that most samples taken, um, especially from surfaces and things like that, um, and sink drains and, and traps and things like that, um, were negative for carapenemase producing organisms. Um, the, the sort of, and I wouldn't say an exception to that because it was a relatively smaller number, um, but wastewater that was taken from inside of pipes in the ICU or uh, from manholes, those, there was only seven samples in each of those classes, uh, but they all had carapenemase producing organisms. So um, while the hospital is overall clean, uh, we, we do know that um, there is a reservoir of these sort of organisms um, that are in, that is in things like wastewater. Um, and in the end, we ended up sequencing uh, about uh, 108, 110 organisms, and we needed to compare those and start to make um, some links between them and between a, a variety of um, patient-derived organisms that we had uh, sequenced already. And um, we weren't going to be able to do that very readily with sort of conventional alignment methods, so um, a lot of this work was done, at least initially, with sort of KMER counting methods. I'm going to talk a little bit about that here. This is... This is actually data from a slightly different um, uh, set of, of isolates, but it's, it's illustrative of the points I wanted to make. Um, and in most cases, we were comparing organisms uh, to each other using, um, using, like I said, using KMERS um, for doing whole genome comparisons to ask how similar is organism A to organism B. We used an algorithm called MASH that came out of the Philippi lab that you can see in the bottom right corner of your slide. There's a reference for that. Um, and what MASH does is it, it's not an exhaust, it doesn't use all the KMERs in a, so when, when I say KMER, I mean that um, we take the genome and break it up into small, um, small words of say 16 or 20 or, or, or 21 bases. Um, and then we're asking the question about um, how many KMERs, you know, if you take all the KMERs from organism A and all the KMERs from organism B, um, if you were to do kind of a classic jacquard um, comparison where you would be asking what is the, the overlap in KMERS over the total union of all the KMERS, um, that would kind of give you a jacquard, what they call a jacquard number, and that, that goes towards one as the two organisms become identical because essentially the KMERS that are shared are the same as the KMERS that are you know, between the combined organisms. And as the organisms get different, that number goes down and gets lower and lower. Um, MASH is using that same idea, but it, it's actually using it, um, it's, it's a min-hashing algorithm that uses a subset, uh, a min-hash subset of the KMERS. Um, and so it's very fast, and you can use it to, to cluster very large amounts of uh, genomic data. And so that's the example that you see in the middle. The heat map um, is, a, is a selection of a bunch of Klebsiella pneumonia organism uh, or, or genomes that we have sequenced. And what you can see is that in this heat map, the whiter the color is, uh, the more similar they are, the redder it is, the more different they are. And so you can definitely see some, some clustering there. Um, the box in the upper corner is all ST258s. And then even within that, you can see clustering of the organisms that came from the 2011 cluster because they're all essentially identical. So this was sort of the method that we used to get an estimate for, um, for how closely related any pair of genomes is. And the method is, is, is quite accurate for very closely related genomes. It, it starts to tail off as they get a little more di distant from each other. The other question that we were asking is this sort of plasmid containment idea, which is a, a variant of, of what I showed on the other, of the other Venn diagram. And that's just asking the question of if you take all the KMERS, and this, this is not using MASH at the time, this is using a different algorithm, 
um, and ask the question of all, are all of the cameras for a given plasmid contained within a genome as a, as a way to say, does this plasmid, is this, is this genome containing this plasmid? And, and we needed to do that because we only sequenced a fraction of our genomes on a, on a long read sequencer, a pack by instrument. So for many of them, all we had was fragmented genomes um, where the, the, the genomes were in many pieces. So what we get out of this, if you were to take, I'll go back for a second, if you were to take this heat map and just cut it off in such a way that you were only going to look at the relationships that were above a certain percent identity, um, and, the, and then the next slide is 99.9, .9, um, you might be able to draw relationships like this. And so what you'll see around the edge of this diagram is uh, different locations that we would have got an isolate from. And so. The, all of the black isolates are from patients. The red isolates are from manhole covers. Um, you can see as you go around. Um, and the, the, the icons are, should be sort of self-explanatory, except for maybe the, the fingerprint, which is a, a high-touch surface. And so we're not showing every single link. There are some sort of kind of redundant and sort of self-identity links here that we're not bothering to show. But um, what you can see is these, these bands that cross over from the patient side of things to some other surface. And those are the ones that we're interested in. Those are, are issues where um, an isolate in a patient is 99.9 .9 or greater than 99.9% .9 identical to an isolate that we got from somewhere else in the environment. Um, and so uh, we took all of these data and we started to look for sort of as sort of individual stories. And then also at the sort of uh, plasmids that we find in general. Um, and while I mentioned earlier that we didn't sequence all of our um, isolates with uh, long read sequencing, um, we did try to sequence sort of every, every example of an isolate that we found. So if we found two isolates that would appear to be very similar to each other, we only sequenced one of them um, with, the, with the PAC bio. And so we got a pretty good catalog of the plasmids that could be found in the environment and in patients. And from that, you can, you can build a... a a diagram that looks something like this. And what you'll see is that the, um, the isolates or the plasmids that are in the green circle are plasmids from environmental isolates. The plasmids that are in the black circle are plasmids that we found in patient isolates. And then the overlap in the middle are, are plasmids that we found in both uh, patients and the environment. And then the, the fractional numbers that you see above them are, are the fraction that we found in each group. So for instance, for the Inc. N family of plasmids right in the middle, you'll see that there were 23 um, of these found in the environmental uh, and seven found in patient isolates. So what you can see here is that there's a, a, a quite a large collection of plasmids that we only ever really saw in, um, in the environment. And um, there's not nearly as much overlap. Um, so th those plasmids have never been seen in patients. And so one, at least the, the, not ever in patients that, that have been sort of ascertained that we've gotten a sample from. And that was, that was maybe a little surprising to us because you might assume that uh, the source for all of this sort of genetic diversity of plasmids would be patient isolates um, being washed down the sink. But, but that doesn't appear to be the case. And we don't, we don't have a, a great explanation for this. There's, there's a lot of factors that are going to determine what organisms and what plasmids get sort of fixed into these sink environments or these pipe environments. Um, and it, it could be that, you know, the, these environments are selecting for certain types of plasmids that are just at very low frequencies in the, the patient population. There's a variety of ways we could explain this. But, um, but the point of this is that there's quite a bit of plasmid diversity and that plasmids that are in patients are a little bit different from plasmids that are in the environment. On the bottom right corner, you'll see a, a key that explains kind of what those the dots are on those. And, and there's a lot of different colors there, but essentially those are all the KPC genes. There's really only, we really only ever see KPC2 or, or KPC3, which are alleles of the same gene. And then the, the outer ring is the context. So where what is the surrounding sequence um, around the KPC gene? And Really common is the, the TN4401 A and B transposons that are, are kind of classically associated with KPC. Um, and then this IS26 TNPA context that we, we talk about a lot in our group that is a, is a common context that's found in this ink family. So um, one thing that we were interested in uh, is, is, again, looking at sort of plasmids and how they're related to each other. And uh, something that we spotted was this, this family of plasmids that um, the, the 
oldest or original one that we we had is this PENT E56. Um, and so that's kind of how we named the plasmid family. But you can see that um, there are examples of it that are KPC negative. Those are the ones at the top. And you can see that there are ones at the bottom that are KPC positive, and they differ by a variety of um, different sort of translocations and recombination events. Um, and, and again, this is, this is not necessarily going to be surprising to anybody who's a plasma biologist, but we thought it was, it, was, it was useful to illustrate all of these different variations and all of these different things that are, are kind of going on in the diversity that's occurring and how plasmids that um, you may kind of not pay much attention to um, because they don't have any genes you're interested in, you know, can eventually become um, plasmids that are carrying a, a KPC gene or some other antibiotic resistance gene. And so it's useful to have, um, when, you're, when you're doing these sorts of experiments, it is useful to, to know all the plasmids that are involved and sort of uh, to be able to see ones that may be coming up as, as being interesting uh, later on. And these were all, these were all gotten um, through, uh, through long read uh, PAC biosequencing. So we're, we're fairly certain about all of these little recombination events. They're not sequencing uh, or assembly errors. So I'm going to end this, this part of the talk um, before my conclusions on um, two different vignettes from this paper. Um, this one's a fairly quick one, uh, and it was an interesting one where um, there's a, a species of, uh, of a bacteria called Leclercia. It's a type of um, Neurobacteriaceae, and um, it's not terribly commonly found. It is, it is an opportunistic pathogen sometimes, um, but it was originally uh, found... Uh, in, a, in a surveillance swab of, uh, from the hospital, but then later on uh, turned up um, in patient B, um, originally in a perirectal swab, and then later it was, it was isolated from, um, from a different sample. And so we got interested in where this leclercia may have come from um, and if it was associated with a source within the hospital. Um, and there was a lot, of, a lot of stuff that went into this, but essentially um, we ended up with uh, the Leclercia is that all of the, the isolates that say LS and IH are ones that we sequence. The rest are um, our reference strains. And so we sequenced eight of them. Um, you can see that they kind of spread out around this tree. It's not a, it's not a terribly deeply or well-sequenced um, genus of bacteria. Um, but we have two larger sort of three um, isolate clusters, A and B, and then this C cluster down at the bottom. Um, and what you can see is that uh, there's an, uh, an isolate from a house, piece of housekeeping equipment. It's actually a mop bucket that clusters very well with the two patient isolates. Um, they're not identical. There are some SNPs between them. Um, so we don't believe that this is a direct transmission. But what it does point to is that this piece of housekeeping from this mop bucket is something that traverses between housekeeping areas and patient areas. That's, I mean, that is the nature of housekeeping equipment. And so um, it really alerted us to this idea that there could be a reservoirs of sort of diversity um, of these sort of diverse organisms that um, could be being shuttled around via, via common pieces of equipment. Um, and the last, the last little story I'm gonna uh, talk about is an interesting one um, that goes back to that original slide that I had with all of the different types of plasmids um, that we isolated uh, in in immediately following the 2011 outbreak. I showed this sort of 20 um, diagrams of different plasmids. And this was a story from that paper that um, at the time we didn't have a good explanation for. Basically, um, at that time, there was a, a patient isolate, this KPNIH27, that had five plasmids in it. And then two isolates, a citrobacter and an enterobacter, that were uh, found um, in sinks. Um, and it, there, there's, a, there's a longer version to this story, but essentially um, we, know that, we know that this patient came in already colonized with a KPC-positive organism. So uh, we, we do not think that this organism came from a sink, or this plasmid, I should say, came from a sink and went into a patient isolate. We're pretty sure it's the other way around, that the patient brought the, this main green plasmid backbone in with them in an organism that... Um, that was known, they were known to be carrying. And then this plasmid um, eventually ended up in the sink. 
And we think it went in the order that it's shown on the screen. So from Klebsiella to Citrobacter, Citrobacter to Enterobacter. And we believe that because of these, um, these insertions. So the first is that there's a small uh, expansion um, in the Citrobacter uh, that's also found in the Enterobacter with an additional um, insertion of an iron uptake element. And so we, we knew that this, that this had happened, that this plasma transmission had happened. But one thing, if you if you're if you've been sort of paying attention, is that the um, the three plasmids in the rightmost organism actually all three of those plasmids have a KPC gene. So I, I'm using kind of the same coloring throughout my slides, in that these kind of cyan and pink dots um, represent the, the KPC gene. Um, and at the time, we really had no idea where these other two KPC positive organisms came from. Uh, we we couldn't speculate on it. But um, the NIH Clinical Center actually um, it has, saves all of the organisms that are isolated, especially KPC positive organisms, um, in the freezers. And we went back and looked at some, some uh, as part of a different project, uh, some isolates predating the, um, the, the outbreak, 2011 outbreak. Um, and specifically, we, 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 we pulled out a, an isolate um, that was from a, a, a urine specimen. And we sequenced it, um, again, completely unrelated to this, but while we were doing all of this MASH clustering and looking for links between isolates, it, it fell out of the data that, um, that this particular isolate from this, this other kind of unrelated um, patient clustered very well with ECNIH2, so that's this last organism. And so that was, that was pretty interesting, um, and when we went and looked really at the alignment of the individual molecules. So again, this, um, this ECNIH2 has a chromosome and then three plasmids, and that's, that's shown in the little box below. And we can see very, very good coverage with very low numbers of SNPs between the chromosomes. So the chromosome is 99% covered with only nine SNPs. And then uh, two of the three plasmids are also covered very well. Um, but that last plasmid, that PKEC39C, is not covered very well at all. About 90% of it is missing. Um, we, can't, we can't find an alignment um, in patient Y, which is, this, this is the, uh, the kind of unrelated patient. And so really what that organism is is, is something like this. Uh, it looks like um, the ECNIH2 minus that plasmid. And so what that leads us to believe, simply because of the, the very, very small number of SNPs and because of patient trace data, we actually, when we went back and looked, it turns out that patient Y and patient A uh, were both in the same room uh, at some point in their stays. They never overlapped, but patient Y was, was in that room from um, 2010 to 2011. And what we believe happened is that the isolate from them um, ended up in the sink somehow and persisted through a time where there was where it was not occupied by patient Y until patient A um, also occupied that room, at which point this uh, plasma transmission event happened, generating ECNIH2, the, the organism with three plasmids. And we thought this was actually pretty remarkable that an organism uh, could stick around in a drain for a while um, and then managed to pick up additional pla an additional plasmid and become kind of a composite organism. And again, without, without um, very, very um, accurate long read sequencing and being really certain that these, these really only differed by a handful of SNPs, I don't know that we would have been as certain about this, um, this conclusion as we are. So my conclusions from this part of this, the, the talk are that hospital plumbing is, is a reservoir for these carapenem producing bacteria, um, parapenemase, sorry, producing bacteria. Um, this environmental reservoir has a huge collection of um, carapenemase encoding plasmids. And some of those overlap with plasmids we see in patients and some of them do not. Um, and then we see evidence of plasmid um, transmission and recombination um, between patient isolates and the environment. Um, and uh, really this was, um, this was quite eye-opening for us. We thought it was uh, uh, something that was, was really interesting and that people would find um, a little bit surprising and maybe also not terribly surprising at the same time. Um, you know, it's, it's perhaps not surprising that 
uh, wastewater would contain sort of antibiotic resistant organisms. But to see these sort of connections between the organisms, between organisms and patients, we thought was valuable. So um, I just want to finish up with my acknowledgments. Um, I'm actually an associate investigator in uh, Dr. Julia Segre's lab. Um, that's the microbial uh, genomics section. Um, so she's, she's actually the head of the lab, and um, we couldn't have done any of this work without her. Um, the, other two, um, the other two scientists that were integral to all of this work are um, Dr. Karen Frank, who is the uh, microbiology head at the time, and uh, Dr. Tara Palmore, who is an epidemiologist. Um, and this really, this combination of genomics, epidemiology, and microbiology um, was, was absolutely critical to both of these studies. Uh, we, needed, we needed all of that information. And so folks from all three of these labs um, were instrumental in getting all of these papers and all of this work done. Um, the, the picture uh, there is of, of other folks from the lab, and uh, not shown in that picture is Evan Snicken, who really got all this started with the, um, the original paper on um, the 2011 uh, cluster of isolates, and he's, he's actually now at uh, University of Michigan. So uh, with that, I appreciate your attention, and um, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Conlon, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and will address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on the screen and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. So let's get started. Our first question is, Do you think it's enough to sequence single isolates from environments or, um, excuse me, or clinical samples? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of mentioned uh, earlier uh, in the slide where I was showing the sort of experiment where we picked 20, 20 colonies from a, a primary sample, ran a quick PCR on them, and showed that they were all what we thought to be the same sequence type. And so that was telling us that in that sample, there, there is a reasonably good chance that it was fairly homogeneous for that isolate. But, um, but in fact, um, it's been shown lots of times by, by different labs on different sort of model organisms that some, some infections do act as these sorts of clouds of diversity where there, there's lots of different variation and, and whatnot in the organism. And uh, in some cases, it's, it really is a clonal, um, clonal situation. And so it somewhat depends on, on what your system is and what organisms you're working on. But um, we've actually uh, taken and started doing things like what we call plate swipes, where instead of sequencing a single organism, we'll, we'll scrape all of the colonies off the plate and then do sort of a more metagenomic sequencing. Um, and then you're, you're going to pile up the reads on a reference genome and um, and look for variation and things like that. And so, um, so yeah, so it, it's, I think in many cases, at least from a clinical standpoint, you really are limited by manpower of, man or woman power of how, how many isolates you can pick off of a plate and analyze. Um, but if, if you do have the ability, if you're planning out a primary sample to scrape that sample off in a whole and sequence it, um, I think you get a valuable kind of information from that. I will say, if you do that, also, you know, you're, you're you're trading off between having individual pure isolates that you can then go back and do things with, um, unless you do that kind of manual labor to kind of pick individual colonies. And them, right? um, but it's definitely something we're aware of, and for some of our studies, we we do a more metagenomic approach. And it looks like we have one more question: Did you ever look at antibiotic-sensitive organisms, cold coat? excuse me, co-cultured from the same samples as resistant organisms? Yeah, so, so we don't, um, again, and, and part of that is uh, because, again, because of the amount of, of work it takes to, to culture these samples. Sometimes there's many samples, and in plating in all these different types of media, every one of these requires uh, you know, a person to, to sit down and do the plating and do the, the picking and the evaluation. Now, that said, um, I think... There, there is some value in doing sort of more of a metagenomic or even microbiome kind of approach where um, if you're interested in a particular organism, um, it may be worth um, doing you know, 
if, especially if you already know the organism, you already have a genome for it, it may be useful to do a more metagenomic approach where you sequence, you know, shotgun sequence, essentially the whole sample. Um, as I kind of pointed out with that, the PENTE56 um, example, if you've, if you've got plasmids in a sample that, that may be in sort of non-resistant organisms but are still interesting or have, for instance, uh, a broad host range um, and would be good platforms, essentially, for an antibiotic resistance gene to jump into and then start moving around, um, it would be really valuable to be able to have that information about what organisms are, are around, what all, organisms are sort of inhabiting the same niche as your, your organism that you care about. I would like to once again thank Dr. Conlin for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.